Welcome to the Data Center Hawk Podcast. My name is Mike Netzer. Today I'm joined by Dan Crosby, founder and CEO of Legend Energy Advisors, who helps companies procure, manage, make sure they're using energy more efficiently. So I'm really excited to talk to Dan today. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what led to the founding of Legend um, and what was your background prior to doing that? Um, so majored in mechanical engineering in college, uh, got really bored with school, started a construction company my senior year. Uh, moved that to Nashville, and then everything kind of blew up for me in 08. Um, so I actually moved to Dallas, literally slept on a buddy's couch, um, got into upstream oil and gas and private equity and waited tables at night, kind of trying to resurrect life again. Okay. Um, and then actually through a waiting tables job, um, got into energy brokerage um, and pretty quickly figured out that no one really understood what was going on, especially energy brokers, um, yeah. but also customers that were... Um, getting and taken advantage of in a lot of ways. And so worked with two different um, energy brokerages and really tried to help customers understand how they were using energy, how market dynamics work, so to create more transparency. And eventually realized I was going to have to go do that on my own um, if I was going to actually be able to create that. I tried creating it at two different companies. Yeah. Um, and so in 2014, with 2000 bucks, I started my apartment in New York. Wow. And here we are. Yeah, so <laughs> 40, almost nine years later, yep. which is kind of at the same time Data Center Rock was founded, so yep. parallel tracks there. Fun journeys. Uh, so talk about kind of the early days of the company. What was the products, the problems you were trying to solve, and how did that grow to where you are today? So, I mean, really trying to help customers understand how they're using energy and what part of that you know, volumetric volatility can they actually control, and how is that interacting with market volatility? Um, and part of what I had to figure out early on was how do you get that data to customers in a high fidelity manner, mm -hmm. which isn't easy. Um, and so I actually spent a whole bunch of time in chicken plants and sand mines and just kind of the nastiest environments we could find to be able to reliably get that data to customers in a really high fidelity fashion so that they could understand what was going on so now they could understand how to interact with the markets better. You could have customers <clears> on <throat> the brokerage side say, hey, my bill almost doubled this month, what happened? And you'd look, well, your usage almost doubled, what'd you do? Yeah. I don't know. Um, so until you're gonna be able to understand that dynamic, yeah. managing market risk is really tough. Yeah, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Exactly. So your company has both uh, hardware, proprietary hardware and proprietary right. software that work together to achieve those goals you just mentioned. Correct. Okay. And that's probably some of your mechanical engineering background, probably a little electrical, and obviously a big software component to just that as well. A lot so of nerdiness. A little bit of everything and a little bit of waiting tables <laughs> and mixed in just for fun. Uh, okay. So, you know, we, we talked last week a little bit about this kind of like the biggest demand drivers, biggest energy demand drivers yep. that you see in the country right now. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was fascinating to me because obviously we're focused on d data centers primarily, and yep. we see that the demand driver that they are yep. and the acceleration of that demand. Um, but talk a little bit about kind of the demand landscape in the U.S. today. Yeah, so I, th I think one of the biggest ironies in energy is this whole concept of energy producers and energy consumers, right? Yeah. It totally violates the first law of thermodynamics. There's no such thing as an energy producer or um, consumer. And so when you really think about what energy is, you know, what people refer to as an energy producer, aka oil and gas companies, are some of the biggest energy consumers out there. Yeah. You're just taking a whole bot bunch of you know, electrical and gas energy and turning it into a higher form um, of energy. Even in like a chicken processing plant, they're making energy for you and me to consume to produces heat. And so, you know, when you think about what's really driving energy right now and, and kind of the dynamics of the market, the dynamics of the infrastructure, it's, it's really three things. The oil and gas space has become wildly more electrical um, than, it, than it was five, even five years ago. Um, electric submersible pumps, uh, now the drilling rigs are going to high line and even fracking, which was traditionally all powered by diesel, is now getting electrified. Now, these, you're talking about 30 and 40 megawatt light switches. Yeah. You can't just plug those things in and flip them on and off. So you have this massive power density um, in the oil and gas space that's driving a tremendous amount of, of demand. You also have electric vehicles, um, which that entire supply chain, and it's kind of cool because we're involved in that entire supply chain from literally mining of, of cobalt and lithium to auto manufacturing, which in the electric vehicle space is very different than traditional vehicle um, assembly and, and creation, much more power intensive. And then you have to fuel it. So there's a tremendous amount being driven there. And then this just explosive growth in the data center space where 
you know, 10 years ago, we were talking about one, two megawatt data centers, mm-hmm. and then it was five and 50 megawatt data centers. We're now working on gigawatt data center projects. Yeah. Um, and so if you look at all three of those things scaling at the same time, it's creating explosive growth and energy density is what matters. Yeah, you mentioned the oil and gas kind of highly accelerating in the last five years. Mm-hmm. That's certainly true of the data center space. And yep. I think we can all anecdotally see the electric car market kind yep. of on a similar trajectory. So it is kind of weird that all those three things have manifest themselves at the same time. And yep. we also talked about kind of the interrelatability of those three. Yep. It's kind of fascinating. So talk about that, the kind of how those three things almost feed off of each other. Well, they're, they're all totally interrelated. Um, if, you, if you think about the technology that's in the oil and gas space. I mean, they can drill three miles away and hit a mailbox, that's um, unbelievable. you know, underground. Yeah. And all of that is being driven by the seismic data and all this other, you know, big data sets, which are obviously being managed and, and provided by the data center space. Mm-hmm. Everything that's going on with AI in your phone, you know, auto you know, self-driving cars, all the mapping. You think about how much data is coming out of an electric vehicle. So all of these three things are really really interacting with each other um, yeah. in real time to drive that exponential growth. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's just they're all whipping each other up into yep. you know, continued higher higher needs. For sure. All right, so enter legend. Yep. Uh, you're talking to any number of groups across those demand spheres, right. which I imagine represents a great opportunity for you all. Um, but kind of like step us through like kind of what, how do you evaluate those groups and then how do you, you know, help them like say, hey, here's what we can do to help bring that usage down or help spread the usage or, or just make it more efficient in general. Well, I mean, there's kind of three parts of the process and that's kind of what legend was founded upon. And part of it's just as my nerdy interest, but you know, how something is, is cited, you know, what does the infrastructure look like when you first engage with a project is going to have a massive impact on, you know, what is your market exposure down the road and how much can you do about it? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, working with big industrials, data centers, et cetera, on site selection um, and understanding how they're going to connect to the electrical infrastructure, how they're going to connect to gas infrastructure, if that's a big input for them, uh, is a huge challenge. And the data center space, we're seeing this all over the place. Um, with trying to find capacity on the grid. In fact, we have some situations where a utility will actually build a transmission line basically under the auspices of I'm 95% of the time, I'm gonna get you power. Mm-hmm. But when I tell you I don't have it, you're gonna drop off. It's almost a, a physical version of what a lot of customers participate in demand response programs. Okay. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of, of shift on the front end infrastructure side. But if you're not able to really, you know, kind of going back to measuring, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. The dynamic ability of customers and companies to manage power and gas in real time, both from the infrastructure constraint side, as well as from the market side is becoming critical. Um, and And if you understand that and how to dynamically manage that, you know, a couple of things happen. One, the whole concept of stranded power in data centers, mm-hmm. when we see some of the similar issues in industrial, um, where you can shift load around even within a, a facility or a site. Um, and then also being able to shift across grids um, and do things dynamically, essentially virtually wheeling, um, is something that we're definitely getting heavily into uh, now to be able to more actively, you know, manage markets because, you know, renewables are having a big impact on how markets function. Yeah. Um, and so being able to respond to that and react to that is becoming more and more critical. Yeah, you did mention stranded power. I'd love to just drill down on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you t- talk about a data center specifically, they're wanting 100 megawatts of power, let's say. Right. And w- we know that ultimate usage is maybe going to be 30 to 50, maybe even right. less than that. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you solve for that <laughs> when, when well, you need to be able to respond to kind of the peak? Right. Well, and, and I think some of that, too, is when you watch the way that data centers scale over time and slowly. Mm-hmm. And when you think about that from a utility perspective, you know, they're really working on two sets of timelines. One is this, this timeline of how long is it going to take me to build something, which often is measured in years. Mm-hmm. But they really typically can't give customers longer than like a one year window of I need you. If you say you need this, you're, you're going to use it or you're going to pay for it. Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of these challenges come is if you want that 100 megawatts, but you're only using 30, you're going to pay for the 100 to reserve yeah. it or I'm giving it to somebody else. So being able to dynamically manage power within a site to increase that den- that density and make mm-hmm. it work. Um, And then also be able to shift um, that where you can get power that actually wouldn't be available. 
um, that's, you know, it's available 95% of the time, but not 100, is, is really how you solve for a lot of those things. And a lot of it comes down to real-time metering. Yeah. And we have facilities, we're literally gathering hundreds of thousands of data points every day out of those facilities every five minutes to really help customers do exactly that, is manage what's going on within a facility better yeah. um, and, and actively. And what, what, what's the opportunity for, again, hypothetically, this is not me, if you're taking a measurement once an hour or once every four hours or six hours or a day mm -hmm. versus you know, every five minutes, what's, what's the, what can be gained by that level of, of granularity? So a lot of things. I mean, one of the interesting things about electricity specifically, it's literally the most inelastic commodity in the world, yep. right? You have to be generating. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and you have to be generating consuming exactly the same thing across a grid. And this is something that's literally balanced on a you know several second basis, yeah. um, which is why you monitor frequency um, is, is to make sure that that's say, stable. And there's all sorts of ways to, to make that stable. So when you think about, you know, traditionally people managing energy on a monthly basis, basis with whatever their bill came in and trying to figure out what they what they did in modern um, energy markets and especially with the size of these loads that's just totally archaic um, when you think about the fact that that price is changing literally every 15 minutes you know some of these grids are settled hourly if you don't have that kind of granularity in data you're you're just out of the game um, and so especially in, in data center applications and some of our industrial applications where customers can actually respond and do things with that load, whether it's actually with curtailment or changing of the way the load's moving or doing something with backup generation or some kind of on-site generation or even a combination of both, there's tremendous opportunity, but you have to have that granularity yeah. of, of measurement. And, and a lot of times that, that granularity of measurement is it's there, but it's in some SCADA system or some system that mm -hmm. operators or decision makers don't yeah. have real time access yeah, to. It's not usable. Exactly. Yeah. And then what do you got? So what would you say is like, almost like if you have a data center customer today, what's an ideal site for them? Geographically? Well, or? like from a, a power, power standpoint. It, short of maybe say like an on-site substation or, right. or dual on-site substations, short of that, kind of, is there a, preferred mix that, that seems to make a lot of sense for data center operators? I think, I mean, you're seeing the the construction now really of like data parks. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, there's a couple projects out there that some of them we've been involved with, some of them we're talking to where, you know, you're, you're talking about a gigawatt of power, you're mm -hmm. talking about multiple transmission lines. Um, people are now building fiber to power, um, which, you know, wasn't happening before. And so, so kind of that ideal scenario is is shifting. I think one of the things that we're also seeing a lot of conversation around is on-site generation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that can be done there um, to provide, you know, one lower power cost. You know, we've seen some customers that have literally, you know, packed Bitcoin mine into a power plant. Yeah. Um, and so all of those dynamics are, are really starting to come to the forefront um, and and that's kind of what's going to create the perfect site um, is if you have the ability to one reliably get power there mm -hmm. two, the ability to tactically manage how you're going to interact with that market and likely how you may be interacting with another market synchronously mm -hmm. um, is really what's creating the ideal data center environment. Um, and, and quite frankly, with the, the fact that, power density is all that matters. One, if you don't have on-site gen, you know, 10 years from now, I think that's gonna be a big game changer. Okay. Um, two, with the continued penetration of renewables, if you can't respond to that um, and interact with that in, in some manner, that's also gonna be a hugely limiting factor. And I, th I think one of the things that's been kind of funny to watch over the last 10 years is, you know, 10 years ago, I talked to a data center about using their backup generation and they just, no. No, 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 that's there yeah. to be looked at. We'll test it once a month, yeah. don't touch it. Um, and that's changing. Um, but when you think about the, the power density of data centers and what their impact on you know, global energy usage is, um, and you know, there's gonna be more and more fluctuation mm -hmm. you know, in that as that growth curve continues, especially not just in the US, but abroad, um, that data centers have to start becoming active market participants in that. Yeah. Yeah, I think we saw a little bit of that with the snowpocalypse back in February yeah. of last year. There, I, 
I can't remember the exact terminology, but there were some data centers I think had given some power back to the grid. Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand exactly what happened well, there? Well, in, the, in, I think it was at December, like Christmas time last year, we had yeah. super freezing cold temperatures, yeah. not URI. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember the exact number, but it was something like 30% of the global hash rate of Bitcoin went offline. And again, it's, you know, tier zero data centers reacting yeah. to price. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, more and more of that is going to have to happen. And the smarter data center companies are and and, you know, there's also kind of this shift of of Colo. You know, a lot of these are almost triple net data centers now. Yeah. So it's becoming less of the data center operator, more of the tenant being smart enough to actually interact and, and be able to you know, do that in real time yeah. and react to events like that. And the irony of it is, if you look at, you know, overall energy costs, and a lot of people are trying, well, you know, how do I get to a three cent power rate guaranteed? Well, in a lot of markets, you can do that if you're able to respond to those kind of catastrophic events yeah. that are going to happen. Um, you know, in, in Texas, we've seen several of these, mm -hmm. you know, really cold events. We also see that the wind to solar handoff in the afternoon, real late afternoon, um, can be another opportunity where prices spike and, and mm -hmm. often hit the price gap. So if you can respond to that, you could make, you know, all of your savings for the year back in like two hours or maybe two days Man. of that year, if you're in a position where you understand what's going on and you know how to respond and you've you know, structure your contract in a way where you can actually take advantage of that. Yeah, I think the knee jerk reaction to that would to a data center operator would be like, that sounds really risky. Mm -hmm. You're going to have kind of, again, the ideal state was kind of like two on site substations right. that are always reliable. And we're mixing in renewable sources, on site gen, gas, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you're saying with the right controls in place, yep. you can switch back and forth between those very quickly. Uh, and it not only you kind of increase your resiliency, your mm -hmm. uptime. You can do it in a way that's like extremely cost effective. Right. Sounds like a home run. <laughs> well, and, and you're 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 doing all three things, right? You're being a better corporate citizen and grid yep. participant because you are actually responding. You're probably going to make a whole bunch of money in the process. You're creating more reliability and you're reducing your cost. And one of the things we talk to customers all about, you know, all the time is it doesn't matter whether you're trying to save the environment or save money. Like, I don't know anybody that doesn't want to spend less and live in a clean well, environment. In some cases, those seem to be mutually exclusive. Right. Uh, but, they're, but they're totally interrelated you, and interdependent. Yeah. Yeah. We can have our cake and eat it, too, is what you're saying. Well, and you can't really <laughs> do one without the other. Yeah. So if you if you really have control over your energy intensity um, and you understand how that your, your load is actually functioning and you understand how the grid dynamics function and you can contract intelligently, you're in a position to respond and do all of those things at the same time. And you're now more resilient. You're more prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have diversified streams and everything yep. else. So, uh, What's well, fascinating stuff? Do anything else to touch on before we jump off here? No, I think it's good. Awesome. I appreciate uh, the time. I really appreciate having you here, Dan. Uh, thanks for being on. Enjoyed it. Thank all you right. so much. We'll see you all next time. Appreciate it.